listeners, welcome back to the Kancha. Another match day of World Cup action. Very exciting today, right? Um, at first, we, we're going to start with the teams that made it through. We're starting with Portugal, who just defeated uh, Uruguay, thanks to goals by Bruno Fernandes. And Dolumbe, you, you must be pretty excited about this. Very much so. Um, you know, I said I was going to sue, like, when this podcast started, but I mean, he didn't score, so I'll just kind of save that for another day <laughs> when he does sort of perform um, better. Yeah, Bruno has come up clutch for Portugal, um, and I think it was on the balance of the game probably deserved. Um, I don't think I think Portugal should have probably conceded. Maybe 1-0 would have been the best results for the day, but yeah, great performance by Bruno. Uh, and yeah, they've been, yeah, they're through uh, one of the, you know, how many teams so far, I think. Yeah, it's just or, them, Brazil, team. and France that are through. Uh huh. So, you know, definitely living up to the billing of, I guess, some sort of favorites and making out of that group is no easy feat. So uh, I really do fancy them going to the next uh, round. Yeah, you fancy them as well because given what happened in the last World Cup when they played Uruguay, and I believe Uruguay were a team to knock them out of the la- in the last World Cup, so they got a bit of revenge for right. that as well. And um, I, I'm guessing with this new Portugal team, what we're seeing is we're seeing them attack more because that's something that Fernando Santos has been criticized of in the past. I mean, yeah, he does have a, a lot of forward-thinking players, I would say. You know, um, probably besides Carvalho and maybe Ruben Neves, but we all know how dangerous he can be from anywhere within 40 yards. Every yeah. other person on that, you know, in that team, you know, like on the midfield up are all sort of very attacking, attacking minded players. So he does have, you know, lots of weapons at his disposal. And uh, yeah, I mean, so far it's worked out for them. Um, I think the defense has also, you know, given a good account of themselves in in bits as well. So it does sort of spell a good recipe, you know, going into the next round. Who I honestly couldn't guess who they would face in the next round because of how, you know, unpredictable the games have been the last couple of days. Yeah, it's been an unpredictable World Cup. I believe there are about 27 teams that don't know their fate yet. That's outstanding. It's it's absolutely amazing, this tournament. I think we're going to get lots of football fans from this tournament. I'm going to turn to you, Mikhail, and I'm going to ask you about Uruguay because I had them top in this group. Obviously, that's wrong. What changed for them in these two games, and why haven't they lived up to the villain of the past? Um... It's tough to really say. I mean, I guess perhaps in the South Korea game when it was a bit cagey, they went for a, more of a conservative draw, or they were playing mostly to not lose, essentially, with some of the substitutions Diego Alonso made. I felt um, when maybe they could have tried to go for something, knowing that Portugal was their second game. Um, and as for the Portugal game, I mean, Portugal are just a pretty good side. They could maybe feel hard done with the the first goal being one of those awkward crosses that looks like uh, Ronaldo's going to head it, but unfortunately he doesn't. And then I guess it's late handball, which definitely shouldn't have been handball according to the, the rules. I guess, but I mean, they've got a hell of a task in front of them, though. Yeah, the yeah. Third game. Um, yeah, and it brings back memories, no, of 2010 when it was Europe versus Ghana. Uh, something oh, happened, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, something something big happened. <laughs> Some handball that changed the destiny of basketball football forever. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Uh, <laughs> I mean, those the Ghanaian players should be fired up for a game like that, which from a Uruguay perspective, I mean, man, they're, uh, yeah, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, they better be ready. But <laughs> the, 
what's interesting is today or um, in the Portugal game, they went with the with three in the back to try to kind of change the shape a bit. Yeah. And played Cavani and uh, uh, Nunez as the forward line. Suarez looked a bit out of sorts the first game compared to, I mean, the Suarez, I guess, you know, we, we saw in the 2018 World Cup. It's not quite the same yeah. player. No. So, yeah, I don't know. It seems to be a bit of a tough task going into this third game with only a point. Yeah, it definitely is. And Oscar, do you see Ghana pulling something out of the rabbit? Because they were very good today. They obviously got the win convincingly against South Korea. South Korea did fight back, but that man, Kudus, who's from Ajax, he did very well in Champions League, is doing very well now. Is this their time? What can I say? Kudos to Ghana. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty. I've been waiting all day to crack that joke. Yeah, they have every chance now getting that crucial win against South Korea. And like Mikhail and you have discussed, this fixture they have on match day three has a lot of how do what word do I use? It, no, history is in the right word. word. Called marble, but like intense hatred, intense, intense passion. Like there's going to be. Not literal bloodshed, but it's going to be figurative bloodshed. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of those yeah. guys, a lot of Ghana, the youngest team in the tournament, and a lot of those kids, their childhood was probably ruined by Suarez playing dirty. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm surprised if Ghana not only beats Uruguay, who they're just playing like Oscar Tabarez is still the coach, but I'm surprised if Suarez doesn't get a kick or two <laughs> for his troubles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it might be best for us doesn't play just not to fire them up. Uh, maybe they go celebrate in front of him. <laughs> the bench <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah it's a big, big opportunity for Ghana at this point, having done the job of getting this win and your guys' results going against them. You know, like I said, makes this group pretty interesting. Yeah, and I guess from a Ghanaian point of view, the good thing for them is they don't have to win this game which sometimes can put you in a dangerous position because you might relax and Uruguay might get two goals, but it's also advantageous that they don't have to be the ones chasing the game. They can wait and they can counterattack Uruguay, which feels like that's their strength. Yeah, definitely. You saw that in the game against Portugal and they did it pretty well. So against the Uruguay team that, you know, need to win, you know, Ghana will definitely look to Hits, hit, hits on the counter and South Korea beating Portugal will probably be a tough ask. So, like you said, Ghana are in a pretty good position. Yeah, they are. And another African team that did the business today was Cameroon. And boy, in terms of crazy games, this was mania because, like, at 3 1, you maybe thought maybe Serbia, they're home and dry. There's no way Cameroon is going to come back, but they do come back. And despite the fact they've been having some issues with the goalkeeper and everything, it's 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 a good story. Oscar? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was um, it's probably the best game of this World Cup so far with amazing goals. You had that great team goal by Serbia that was finished by Mitrovic. You had Abubakar's insanely filthy finish. You had you had, you know, goal mount action on either side. And for Cameroon, it's very good that they got this win, this draw. So it feels like a win because of, like you said, the whole thing going on with Onana, not wanting to follow the coach's instructions and whatnot. So from their point of view, it's good that they push that aside and just try to get um, the result they needed. Yeah, and for Serbia, this must be a kick in the nuts because they would have expected themselves to get a win. And now they're going to the Switzerland game in the same situation as Uruguay in that they need to win and Switzerland can obviously effectively counter them. But I have a question for you. Why do you think Zlahovic hasn't really played so far in this World Cup? I have absolutely no idea. But Mitrovic in this game really justified the selection. So yeah. can't really complain. If... There was a way to play two of them together. I think that would be great. At least the lineup from Serbia today was more attacking and more forward thinking than what they did against Brazil. So I don't know. I still think though that at least 
the gap between Switzerland, Serbia, and Switzerland, Serbia, and then Cameroon can also qualify. Cameroon obviously have the toughest job of beating Brazil, even though right. Brazil have qualified, but you know, it's what it is. And in that showdown between Switzerland and Serbia, let's say Cameroon loses the final game, who do you think comes out on top? I'm going to say Switzerland because he in summer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it comes if it comes down to it, he in summer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I think you know what I'm. I'll say Switzerland as well. Um, Makai, I'm going to switch to you for Brazil because they're one of your favorites to get to the final and. Have they proved it in their last two games? You weren't here for the first game, but like seeing Brazil both games from them. What are your impressions so far about them? Yeah, they found it a bit difficult. That's again just uh, what you get when you enter the World Cup. But yeah, they I think they've they looked pretty decent for the most part. Um, as expected to play with a, a very high press relentless press for that matter. And then the width that Vinicius and um, uh, Rafinha provide. But yeah, they're able to kind of keep the ball moving essentially, generate a lot of opportunities. In that first game, I think uh, Rafinha perhaps could have found himself on the score sheet a couple of times. But I think the biggest question now with the job done and secured entering the knockout stage is whether or not their star player be healthy uh, with yeah, his ankle. But, yeah, because Neymar is obviously injured. But even looking forward to that game, right, they have a selection of Uruguay, Uruguay, Ghana, or South Korea, and that should be no big deal for Brazil. It shouldn't be. They should be, they should be confident enough to uh, be able to uh, beat any of the three sides. And but for, for Brazil, I mean, I think the big question is, though, as soon as they, that next, uh, I mean, you can't take any knockout stage for granted by any means. Yeah. And what do you think about Brazil against Cameroon? Do you feel because Brazil are already qualified, do you think that's an opportunity for Cameroon to maybe make it through? Certainly an opportunity. I think they'll most definitely rotate. Um, a lot of players, particularly some of the older players on this squad, Thiago Silva, Casemiro. Um, I mean, and, you know, the team doesn't have Casemiro, for example, in it. Yeah. He, he's very, very good at cleaning up and um, shutting down fires here and there. Uh, and but yeah, Cameron. Well. Pardon? He's also a goal threat as well. Yes, as we found up <laughs> against the. The Swiss found out today, yeah, most yeah. certainly. One thing that I do think actually benefits them, which um, just unfortunately happened to Danilo with his just injury here, is um, how Militao is placed as a right back. Because him as a right back, I mean, he he would probably be starting on any every single national team that is in Brazil at the moment. Um, that's kind of a coach's decision here that Chi Chi is playing Thiago Silva. But with Militao and his pace, that kind of allows what happens now is to, or against um, Switzerland, Thiago Silva actually moved to the right side of center back. So with Marquinhos and Militao there, that kind of covers for his biggest weakness, essentially, which is just lack of pace. So something, I guess, looking for these next games or so, it might actually benefit them down the road. Yeah, it might, it might benefit them. And let's move on to France, who were another nationality that, or country that qualified uh, for the next stage. Like with France, they struggled a bit with Denmark, but Mbappe got the job done. And I also asked the panel, like who had Mbappe as a top scorer? Because he's looking like he's going to win that bet. I believe it was me. It was you <laughs> made yeah. the wise decision to change it from Benzema. <laughs> Benzema, yeah, I think the Kane stunks have been down <laughs> in this World Cup, but I should have bet. <laughs> <laughs> with France, like 
do you see them as the biggest threats against your Portugal bat? I will say it is hard to pick between them and, and Brazil at the moment. Um, but yeah, they do have, you know, um, star quality, obviously in Mbappe, him winning, or, well, I guess on pace right now to probably you know, win golden boots and everything. Um, I so I so I guessing that they, they would rest some players, you know, at least in some key positions, um, you know, for the final game of, of the group stage. But uh, yeah, them them and Brazil, I would say, are like kind of neck and neck, you know, in terms of who can pose the most danger to upset my pick for Portugal to win everything. And is there a player for France who has impressed you that you didn't think was that good, but has changed your opinion? Rabio mm. has been one of, I think, their most consistent performers in, in their squad. And it's funny because, yeah, he's just, he, he seems to be box to box at the same time. Like, you know, um, trying to see what person to like liken him by like you know let's say from back in the day but he does a lot of like you know transition play and breaking tackles and pushing the ball forward so he's been a really good player for them um uh, for for in my opinion i'll probably say one of the like i said unexpected sort of performance for the uh, for french team french team yeah and any opportunity Easy on the final game? No. no. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Like, I feel even if Brazil, also Brazil, uh, France feel that, you know, like their backup players for the most part, they will still um, perform well. And I think it's more, um, the fact that that would be the case is more because Tunisia haven't really been convincing in any sort of, facet of, of the game so far. I don't think they've scored a goal with this World Cup, have they? No, they haven't. They really fumbled in the bag against um, against Australia. <laughs> I expected that to be a win for them and maybe put them in a better position, but uh, it doesn't look good. It doesn't yeah, look good. Yeah, and Oscar, for Oscar, between Australia and Denmark, who do you think is going to be able to get that win or claim that second spot since Olympia has rightly said that Tunisia, they have Zero to no chance against France. I have picked Denmark, but they've just not shown up at this World Cup yet. So Australia looked good against France, also France completely blew them away. So maybe I'm going to say it's my chance as a draw, but let me quickly see who's second with that group now. Bear with me, guys. Um, okay, Australia are going through. Yeah, straight up right there. Okay. Yeah. And now we're going to go to the one of the first teams to get eliminated. A moment of silence for Canada for that great Canadian team that impressed all of us against Belgium. But against Croatia, they were thoroughly outclassed, right, Mikhail? Oh yeah, most certainly so. Croatia were ruthless at taking their chances which should be something for other teams to consider down the road, um, assuming nothing goes wrong for them. But yeah, all in all, I mean, Canada should be proud. Their performance against Belgium was brilliant, apart from just a lack of a clinical finish here or there. Um, and even their start against Croatia, I think those first 15 to 20 minutes were pretty impressive. However, yeah, aside as good as Croatia, um, a finalist, Four years ago, um, certainly, certainly uh, got the job done. Yeah, but no, oh, sorry. no, but it, it's it's just good essentially for, um, I guess, the young players to kind of get some experience in there. Um, in addition to, I guess, the usual suspects, there's um, a 20 year old. Um, uh, gosh, his first name is escape me, but Kone played center midfielder that came on. He came on for Belgium and then came on in the second half against Croatia. He looks looks a very good player as well. So good to get yeah. reps to some of the, some of those. And I think the biggest weakness for Canada in this World Cup was 
the midfield because, or the center of the pitch in general, because on the wings, I feel they're very good up top. I feel that David is a good striker that can develop, but I feel in the center, in the center of the defense and center of midfield, besides Ustakio and maybe Atiba Oxenson, they really lacked a, a lot of quality there. And Atiba is about 38 years old. He's not going to be the run in the same game that Herman wants to run. But going forward, hopefully that can change for Canada. But speaking of Herdman, do you think his comments about screwing Croatia, do you think that was wise from this path? Um, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> probably not. Yeah, I mean, I think privately he might regret it, but publicly, I think he's come out to say he doesn't. And uh Essentially, it was uh, an attempt to get his team going. Or I guess he um, he had like that team talk on the on the field after the Belgium game, and I guess immediately after he was asked that question by a reporter, by the sideline reporter. So yeah, yeah <laughs> something he'll rue, but oh well. <laughs> yeah, maybe too much adrenaline. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, but for for Canada, I think it's it's been a good campaign. They've shown their face. They scored their first ever goal in the World Cup. There's still one more game to go against Morocco. Um, how do you see that going? Do you think Canada can play party poopers? It's, it's tough to say because I'm not, I mean, obviously they'll go and try to win it, but I think it also matters whether or not Herdman will decide to kind of allow some of the, the players that haven't gotten on the pitch yet to yeah. just really just, you know, experience the World Cup, given it's the first time since the mid 80s, right? But I mean, I, I do tell you what, like <laughs> that Morocco fan base will be bumping against them. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they definitely will be, especially after the big result they got against Belgium. And I'm going to take a lap of honor here for myself because I mentioned that Belgium might be one of the weak links in this World Cup, <laughs> given, given the squad. And I'm I'm glad this turned out to be true because uh, I would have looked like a total idiot if they won the script in nine points. But Oscar, the game against Morocco, did that surprise you? Not at all. I think two of us privately discussed that if Belgium may have gotten away with that terrible performance against Canada, but they won't get away with it against Morocco and Croatia. And you are right. The only good player from the first game in Courtois was joined the list of terrible players with his mistake. Uh, personally, I love to see that, but club bias aside, it's not been good for Belgium. There's been no energy, no urgency. Teams just outrun them, outplay them. And we have to really credit Morocco because this was their first walk up win since 1998, I believe. Wow. And they've really set themselves up because they're playing against the Canada team who will probably not be motivated to win. I have nothing to play for. And Belgium have to face a Croatia team who just showed how dangerous they can be against Canada. So if you're Morocco, you're really, really, you have a really, really good chance of qualifying for the next round. Yeah. And the thing with this Belgium team, it seems like in the best of times, the, while they were good, there were lots of infightings and According to the Madrid zone, they reported a fight between Hazard, Vertonghen, and De Bruyne that's observed by Lukaku. So it seems like there isn't that much cohesion in this team. There's lots of like infighting. Courtois hasn't spoken to De Bruyne in like years. So <laughs> there's a lot of understandably, rock. understandably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but oh. the, infight, the other infight is um, news to me, but yeah, if that's the case, then it's making the situation worse, right? Because this is supposed to be the quote-unquote golden generation that everyone expected to do things. And the fact that they're coming to the end and are fighting now is really not a good sign. Yeah. And yeah, Mikhail, what are your thoughts on this situation? Mikhail? Oh, pardon me. I just had a question about um, Belgium because in theory, they can salvage it with what looks to be, I guess, a difficult 
win against Croatia, but obviously they're, you know, they're going to try to, you know, uh, garner some sort of energy or whatnot. But, like, what what do you think that Martinez can, like, change to actually, like, go after the game? Because they just look so lethargic in these two games that, you know, uh, they would expect to just be the clear-cut dominant team. True. I feel the introduction of Mertens actually helped them. Maybe introducing the younger Hazard might help as well. Also, one thing that we, we've not mentioned is they've really missed Lukaku throughout this entire tournament. And although it didn't work out for him at Chelsea, but when Romelu Lukaku is on the form and he's a leader, he makes such a difference. You saw the difference he made when it was at Inter Milan. And I feel maybe he might be the missing dynamic that they're lacking because he's someone who's a leader on the pitch. He's someone who all the players respect, all the players seem to get along with. So, but it, it's difficult, right? Because when you're a team like Belgium and so many of your main starters are on form or are out of form, part of me, it makes it super hard for cohesion. And that's why when I saw that team that they had out, I was like, this is a candidate for a team that could just flop because a lot of things are just not going right for them. And it's very difficult for a manager to change that situation. Yeah, I would agree with you. I feel like the only thing he could change was introducing some younger players. Like he brought in Onana, who I thought at least was good against Morocco, but then he took him off and Belgium fell apart. So I feel at this point, the country just needs, to, the national team needs to bed in younger players because the older generation are either out of form or are past it. Yeah, and De Bruyne, he alluded to that in an interview there, Then he was speaking about the expectations for the World Cup. And he said that, you know what, this team, we were good in the past, but 2018 was our moment. Right yeah. now, we're too old. And he's about 32, and he's not, he's one of their best players, but he's not at his best World Cup because even in the Canada game, you could question some of his decision making and his incisiveness. So yeah. it's, it's tough times for them. Mm -hmm. And yes, yeah, it seemed like it was going to be tough times for Germany as well. But Oscar, they, they pulled a rabbit out of the hat, Germany. They scored a goal, they changed something, and it's good for play. Yeah, it makes the group really interesting. Also, the earlier results that Costa Rica had. But yeah, Germany, in the last 20 minutes of our game, they dug into, they found something within themselves and were able to um, give themselves hope going to the final day. And it's somewhat in their hands, depending on if Japan can pick up something against Spain. So they've done themselves well by getting the draw in a very difficult game. Yeah, yeah, because I feel if Japan ties against Spain or something and Germany blitzes Costa Rica, which is not guaranteed, Germany can go through. So I feel it's it's a very it was a very good point for both sides, given Spain's goal difference is so high. Mm -hmm. And that means they can relax. And also Germany they puts them back into contention. But at the same time, I was also slightly disappointed with Spain. I felt they were a bit nervous. They were a bit, the young players were, they showed their lack of experience in this game. Against me. Yeah. Spain sometimes have the same problem Barca has. Like you have too many players that are very talented, but they're not in their prime yet. So let's say Gabi, for example, he didn't have his best game. I feel like it's something he'll learn from. But yeah. overall, I thought Spain were okay give, for the first 60, 70 minutes, given that they're playing against a team that's like them, that presses and likes possession. But after their goal, the subs that Luis Enrique made just hit Spain in the place where we can't mention because <laughs> honestly, besides Morata, all the subs are just giving the ball away and it's frustrating because it's the same thing Barcelona do in big games that gives them issues. And one of these turnovers led to a goal for Germany. And yeah, looking at that, you have to be frustrated, but then hopefully it can be a lesson learned for this young team. And regardless, they're 
still 90, according to the stats, 98% sure of going through. Well, who knows with this crazy yeah. World Cup? Yeah, who, who knows, especially with Costa Rica. I, I never saw it coming that Costa Rica was going to beat Japan. Macau, do you see that coming? Not at all, no. Not what, what do you think all. was the difference? Uh, honestly, I think the biggest difference was the fact that Japan put their foot off the pedal. I think the coach made five or six changes from wow. the Germany game, which, uh, yeah, I think that might be the biggest thing. I mean, because Costa Rica are always going to play the same way, or to essentially just get as many men back behind the ball and try to counterattack. Um, but, yeah, they were able to just get a decent opportunity late in the game and kind of able to shut things down after that. Yeah, I haven't seen all four. Do you think Costa Rica or Japan have any chance against Germany or Spain? I, th- I mean, Japan, I th- you'd think Japan should have a chance, per se, against Spain. I mean, Spain have been brilliant, though, all in all. But just given what they were able to do against Germany, uh, particularly with their substitutions late in the game. But, yeah, I wouldn't put... I think they missed their 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 big chance of taking care of Costa Rica. For sure. For sure, they really did. Argentina didn't miss the big chance, though, right? Oscar, in that game against Mexico. Mexico, they, they came to the game... Quite, it was quite a cagey game. Like I, I watched the game with a bunch of friends, and the first half was really boring. It was zero zero. But, the first half. Man. Sorry to interrupt you. The first yeah. half was making Mexico pull and look like a great game. <laughs> <laughs> like the yeah. first half was just foul throwing, goal kick, foul throwing, goal kick. There was no quality at all. No. In the second half, though, as Mexico sat back more and more. And Argentina pushed on and introduced better players. You know, quality started showing in, and then Messi does what he usually does. Yeah, he, and, yeah. He, he gets criticized for not showing up enough for his national team, but at least in the group stages, like I feel he's been very decisive in the last three World Cups for Argentina. Hmm. And yeah, and what, go on, go on. And what an introduction Enzo Fernandez was. Why hasn't he started games for Argentina? He seems to have that difference of quality. Like you mentioned last podcast, they miss him much also. They miss him a lot of this spark. Why hasn't Enzo Fernandez been that guy? I don't know. I guess Scaloni, at least he tried to address that Los Celso shaped hole by bringing McAllister. But I think that hole is going to be filled by Enzo Fernandez moving forward. Yeah. Granted, this performance by Argentina wasn't like a vintage performance, but it was still good enough. There's just still some concerns like who should play between Guido and Paredes. When would the Paul remember how to play football again? <laughs> who is which rights back are they going to use? You know, stuff like that. But you know, they have the important win and they have that big game on Wednesday against Poland. Oh yeah, it's gonna be Messi versus Lewin Disney. I High profile it. stuff. It's going <laughs> to be going painful for me. <laughs> God. I wish there was the way both of them could go through, but then if they draw, Messi will have to face Mbappe again. And I don't <laughs> want that to no, on this game, I'm very sorry. You have to you have to go home. <laughs> Unless yeah. the other games somehow favor Poland. Yeah, true. But but moment of Talk for Lewandowski because, like, he scored his first ever goal in the World Cup. He seemed to, it seemed that that was weighing on him for such a long time. Yeah. Especially when you see that penalty miss that he had mm-hmm. against Mexico. But it was, I was happy to see him score. I was happy to see the way his teammates embraced him. It felt like exactly it was, it was beautiful. Really big. Yeah. You say the way it was emotional. I'm like, this is probably up there with the biggest goals he scored in his life. And yeah, it was. Just overall a great day for Poland with the win over Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah, it really was. I'm going to switch to you, Mikhail, because for Mexico, it seems like all is lost. Yeah, like They haven't really been good in this tournament. 
they've rather been bad in this tournament. But they come to the final match day with this big opportunity against Saudi Arabia. Do you think they can change something and get that big result? Mm, I mean, you always can, but I, I have a feeling they won't just primarily based on their past performances against Argentina and Poland and um, how good Saudi has been. I've been really impressed with them, um, despite the fact that they lost against Poland. And obviously, we all know the Argentina game. Uh, they've been pretty impressive. And I, I, I honestly think Saudi should be fancying their chances against Mexico. Yeah. Mexico will need a bit of luck as well. I mean, with goal differential, if they're to beat Saudi, it's like you're, you're going to be relying on either Poland beating Argentina or you're, you have to rack up the goals. Yeah, it's, it seems like it's going to be super tight for them. And it was super, it's going to be super tight for the USA, right, against Iran? Yes, that'll be a very difficult game. Iran, yeah, I'm still kind of confused what Kirosh was thinking the first game I mean he changed them from a back four to a back five the last time they played with a back five was I think eight years ago against Argentina um but yeah they were excellent against Wales in terms of their defense and how they're able to break they almost break with ease essentially when it goes to their counter-attacking yeah and, and what was Wayne Hennessy thinking <laughs> against Iran and that was such a massive error for Wells. Yeah, I think so. I think, again, I think it was just underestimating just Iran, kind of basing it off their previous game, where it's like, yeah, this team lost by four goal margin to, to England, therefore they're rubbish. It's not necessarily the case. I mean, there are two friendlies prior with a full European team. They beat Uruguay, Uruguay, and then they also drew. Senegal's very good side. Um, it's just the shape as well, right? Like that Iran plays. I don't know if that allows them to do things differently. It also helps that uh, Azmoun is a bit more healthier than he was the first game too. I think yeah. he was injured for the longest time with Bayer Leverkusen. Yeah. It's, yeah. Speaking of that game against the USA, did you hear about the comments Clinton made about Iran and the response from Carlos Queiroz? Uh, whose comment? Uh, Jurgen Klinsmann. Jurgen Klinsmann. So, yes, I did see yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you make of it? I don't know. It's interesting. I don't I honestly think there might be some more there behind them. Or I know Klinsmann has been known to say or to um, be a bit abrasive with his comments every now and then. I think as like uh, the U.S. men's national team coach, he very openly said that MLS wasn't the, the greatest league in the world and that like this player should be going to Europe all the time which isn't necessarily the best look um for I guess the country you're you know representing but yeah I don't know it's, it was quite humorous to be honest uh Kirish's tweets definitely did not take them too kindly though and I mean Klinsman I mean you can't really say that though that's it's a bit rude yeah yeah, I think he like insulted the culture, the players of Iran, which uh, it's never a good. It's never a good thing to do. Yeah, especially it's, it's, what what happened to Canada? Yeah, it was leading to some pretty uh, weak stereotypes again. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, but on on the pitch, how do you see this the pattern of this game going, and who do you think is eventually going to win? Um, I think it'll be a very difficult game from the U.S.'s perspective. Um, for you know, they were brilliant against England, by the way. Um, yeah. Particularly setting up in a mid block with the midfield and Pulisic dropping back into midfield. England, I mean, the best three midfielders on the pitch were all American, which is you know wild to say given the talent we all know England has. Um, but yeah, the U.S. has a significant issue breaking teams down I mean in qualifying the only away win they will, were able to garner was against Honduras away who finished last in the, out of the 
eight teams in total for qualifying. I mean, CONCACAF qualifying away is difficult, but I mean, they, the one thing that they definitely lack or struggle with is breaking teams down, and that's precisely what they're going to have to do against Iran. And I honestly think Iran will probably get through just by the simple fact that all they need is a draw. Yeah. Yeah, which makes it super, super complicated for the U.S. But I'm going to move on to England on the day. And Gareth Southgate, at first, it seemed like, oh, it finally got things right. They were scoring goals. Everything was happy. And they're tested against the U.S. And as Mikhail has alluded to, the three best midfielders in that game were American midfielders. Where do you think England goes from here? And what do you think happens to Southgate after this tournament? Because it seems a lot of fans, like I was speaking to a fan in the pub uh, over the weekend, and he was terribly disappointed with how England played, with where they're going. And do you see this as his final tournament? Or do you think he can change this and they can go very far in this tournament? I think they do have like questions for me. And like you said, the, the midfield, um, there's, I don't think there's any way that the U.S. midfield should be dominating the English midfield, but there's some shopping decisions like me. I, I, I think I mentioned at the start of you know, the World Cup where I was like really looking forward to Phil Foden and him making his name on the stage for England, and I don't think he's featured for England yet. But yeah, Mason Mount played the whole 90 minutes of that game against USA. And I don't know what stats I saw about how many times he maybe gave the ball away or I think his, his most decent efforts, or, you know, like one shiny moment was like a, a, a shot um, from this 25 plus yards out and everything. But he's been largely ineffective to me um, at times, like going forward. And how he gets to play 90 minutes is beyond me. Um, it, is that a personal issue with Phil Foden? Because he's been brilliant for City throughout the season. Is there a reason why he's not playing? Because that has to be, can be tactical, can it? Yeah, it does. It definitely seems like some sort of bias in a way. I feel Mason Mount must have some like tremendous juju man working for him. <laughs> it's the same way yeah, he I plays think... almost 90 minutes for Chelsea and stuff like and you can see he's doing nothing and he's still on the pitch. I'm like, why is this man just running around in the middle of the, in the pitch trying to be like Messi, but like Lampard, but they're not doing either at the same time. <laughs> it's like in between, but he's not doing anything effective. I don't know. Yeah, Oscar might have some insight on this um, forward and Southgate situation. You know, a wise man, me, once said, there's no higher rated player in the world than an England substitute. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the thing, right? England have a midfield problem where the starting midfield is usually average, except for the work rate they gave you know playing for the badger and stuff. Do they have creative players? Yes, they have talented players in full. Then maybe not so much Grealish since he moved to City. Bellingham definitely. Do these players get picked? No, only God knows why. James Madison is another one, I think could solve a lot of the creativity problems I have. they have in midfield, but I agree. it seems it was Southgate wants to play his son all the time. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. England, what's holding them back is themselves. So if they want to really bring it home, at least their defense is whatever. The midfield can be improved, but they choose not to play those players. And like Mikhail said, the fact that the best three midfielders where USA midfielders should be, you know, something for England to look at. And what's your response to that, Lindy? No, I mean, it's, I, I completely forgot about Madison as well, but he does sort of give you a different, you know, just a different, like attack the problem from a different angle. You can just, you know, you, you uh, keep the same tools, trying to open that the same, you know, like a better result or something different happens. I, I just don't get it for me. Um, 
so yeah, they definitely can change, um, you know, like going forward, like personnel wise, they do have enough versatility to pose problems for whomever they face. It's just whether or not the manager is going to like, you know, shape up and actually make the decision, so to speak. Um, so, you know, I mean, USA was their first major test and I don't even think their last game is going to be that much easier with Wales where Wales are going to be playing with the chip on their shoulder and wanting to, you know, grab their own pound of flesh, even if, you know, things in the other game might not go in their, like, way, but they'll, they will want to definitely leave a mark to, even if hamper, um, you know, England's progress in the World Cup, they will want to leave their mark in some way. Yeah, like, the one thing is they're for sure going through, so I, I think they have no no problems to worry about, but they definitely going to need another another level of performance than what they showed against the USA. And you mentioned that you were quite confident that England can beat anyone in Group A. Has your opinion changed? I haven't seen how good Senegal have been in the last couple of games. Ecuador, maybe the Dutch, they're not. They've, they've, they've disappointed, possibly. But has your opinion changed given that? I think it has. It has. I, I, I felt Netherlands would be the most you know, like the one that posed the most threats or the biggest threats, you know, to um, England going forward. And Senegal did give a really good, you know, account of themselves in the last game. So they can definitely hold their heads high knowing that, you know, just throw caution to the wind in the last game and, you know, you can come out top in that group potentially. So um, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. Uh, I know that, yeah, they, they, England, that's the thing, though. They, they come in with so much promise, you know, like what uh, Moscow said about, you know, no, no, there's no player better than the one on the bench. Yeah. And then that is true, but it's like at the same time, it's like they have, you know, like the most popular, you know, prim, um, club league in the world. And then you think, oh, yeah, they should definitely be the most convincing right like you know just yeah. otherwise but oftentimes they fall short and i don't really know you know why but yeah i'm not as confident as, as i initially was that they would walk through you know into the quarterfinal yeah yeah and speaking of that group group a mikhail ecuador you ribbed about them at the start it seems you were right they really impressed against the dutch they, they did well against qatar they have a final i'm gonna use a Spanish phrase, <laughs> the final version, <laughs> but they do have a final against uh, Senegal. How do you see that going? Oh, I think this will be a brilliant game. <laughs> both both teams have looked actually pretty good. I thought Senegal was hard done to have um, let in those two goals against the Netherlands. I thought they would performed well against them, but yeah, like Ecuador has been they've been brilliant. Been very impressed with um, Gustavo Alfaro as well. He, in the first game, he led everyone to believe he was going to play with a 4-3-3, but kind of switched to a 4-4-2, which is, was unusual given the lack of preparation time, right? We only had a week. And then for the Netherlands game, he switched to back three, which, again, is also very unusual. But, yeah, it, it worked perfectly for both games, so for the most part. So, um, yeah, I mean, the Senegal game, I think, will be brilliant. I don't know who will come up thought out what the outcome will be though. Um, but it should be a cracker of a game. Yeah, it really should be. And how impressive have you been with Anna Valencia? Because he's throwing tough for Kylian Mbappe at the moment. <laughs> yeah, he is. What what's up? It's tough to say though with Valencia going into this next game because he kind of hobbled off for the second game in a row. So it's yeah. Fingers crossed that he's actually able to to play. But yeah, he's it's been brilliant delivering. Yeah, he's been which really I, good. I, which I also led with the caveat that that would be like their biggest issue of a lack of goals. But <laughs> I guess I just <laughs> not read into to Mr. Valencia here. <laughs> sure, sure. The Senegal they they're scoring goals too against Qatar. Um, I'm gonna ask Oscar to come in because uh, there are two players who he knows very well that they haven't really 
hit the lights up in club football, but for the national side, they're doing really well. And that's Sabalia, Betis, and Bulaidia for Villarreal, who left Villarreal for Salentina because Emery thought it wasn't that good, but he's showing that he can score goals for club and country. Is he going to be one of those um, key factors for Senegal if they are to win this? Yeah, like he's going to have to be really, really decisive if Senegal beat or to beat Ecuador. So as you saw, great strikers instincts from him to score that goal against Qatar. And Sabai, even though I was roasting him the first game for taking say long shots against the Dutch, I thought he played well and nullified Qatar on their left side because they were kind of dangerous there with Afif and everything. And yeah, it's the fact that they've nullified the goal difference problem they had from the first game is good. They just have to beat Ecuador. And for Ecuador, Ecuador ha have to, you know, avoid losing. So it's a really interesting final, final as you say. You know, Zidane would be, proud of, <laughs> would be proud of a game like this because he loves finals, in quotes. But in yeah. any case, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this game in particular. Yeah. Netherlands should take care of Qatar, but they should. They should. Yeah. Should I should we talk about my embarrassment for Qatar? <laughs> yeah, you said they wouldn't score. And... <laughs> yeah. oh, just moments later. <laughs> moments <laughs> later. <laughs> oh my god. I need to stop predicting this year. Obviously, yeah, I mean, you're the only one embarrassed. I said Uruguay will be dark horses and the brothers can't even score a goal. <laughs> Yeah, on Netherlands, and anyone in the panel can jump in for this one. They they've been super disappointing. Yeah. And do we know the reason, and do you feel that something Van Hal can change? The thing is that from the two games, it's a complete lack of ball retention. They gave the ball away so many times in completely dangerous positions, and defensively they've just been all over the place sometimes which you think is weird because they have Van Dijk, they have um, Timber, Delict, Ake, Blind, good experienced defenders but the way also I feel like the way Senegal and Ecuador have just gone about their business when it comes to playing the Dutch deserve spirits because they've really been direct and aggressive against their Ranger. Yeah and Mikhail Olimbe do you have any points in the Netherlands? Sorry. Yeah, I'm not totally sure. I'm also kind of baffled by how, ab not average, but they've definitely underperformed. Um, I think a lack for their goals, essentially, might have been a little bit problematic for creating opportunities. That was maybe something to look at, just simply by the fact that Depay Dubai's been injured for a while, right? Like, yeah, mm -hmm. he has been. Yeah, maybe Shabby Simon, you know, partners with Gakpo at club level. And they, yeah. you know, they've been pretty good. I mean, they beat Arsenal. I think they were, like, one of the only few teams. They played really mm -hmm. well in the game, you know, yes. domestically. So maybe that's something to kind of lean on, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's something That's something to do. And Olympe, do you think... What do you think the Dutch can change going into the last 16 to make that difference? Well, um, I know Gakpo has been like a shining light for them in many regards. Already talks of him going to Manchester United, which is kind of typical of them to be the first to sort of jump on some. Well, I, think, I mean, budding superstar in many ways, and it maybe need him in some regards. But um, what can Netherlands do? I, they, they, you know, the ball retention, like Oscar said, is an is an issue for them. Um, I think as well is which how them playing for them? No, he's injured. See, I think he would have been, you know, that um, driving force. Um, that would help give them lots of energy and drive, you know, through the middle of the park that I don't think they have right now, you know. And yeah, they they are struggling. I think even you know, despite being you know coming back from an injury, like uh, Mikhail said, 
and not having you know a kind of clinical enough striker in that in that sense they they do sort of struggle through the middle is always kind of through the wings they build from so i think they're just going to try and um they definitely need to work on that possession game um if they can kind of get that you know sorted out for the most part yeah, they might you know barring a disaster against qatar you know they would face what maybe uh usa or something you know in the next round or Wales or something so you know i think they would, they would fancy the chances against either of those teams so yeah. potentially you know they could yeah, lose themselves in uh in yeah. the quarterfinal and it's like, yeah. yeah it's very yeah yeah, yeah it is it is uh so i'm gonna ask the panel now that we speak we've spoken about an underperforming team to speak of what team was the best performing team so far starting with you Limade. or for max a2 my bad yeah um that's fine um most the best performing the best performing team and player for max a2 okay okay oh okay just for max a2 oh okay a2, yeah I mean, it's hard to, for players, hard to look beyond um, Messi. Yes. As hard as I, you know, <laughs> I don't want to like give him credit. So I know like the second goal, you know, is, is really all Endo uh, Fernandez, right? Is that thing? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's all him. Like he creates the space and, you know, kind of finishes it well, quite um, beautifully as well. But, you know, you can't, you can't, it's hard to look beyond him. Or actually, I'm thinking about, Someone from the Ghana game. Ooh. I was also Kudu. Yes, Kudus. Yes, I'll, I'll much better give him. <laughs> so, yeah, he he gets credit for being the most influential and uh, for team for team as well. I think I would say Ghana as well because oh. of what you know like how they've been able to change their fortune and especially as when you look at the final game of the group to potentially beat Uruguay and make it through or uh, it would be very sweet for them so they've definitely written themselves like you know their names are more or less written in the stars it's just for them to realize it now so yeah though that would be my pick yeah Oscar you want to respond uh yeah um I'm going to since he did. He dropped Messi. I'll say Messi was probably the best player. Yeah. I was going to say Lewandowski too, but I'll say Messi, I guess. And then best performing team. Uh, this one is a bit harder. Yeah. Maybe. We went with. Um, let's just give a shout out to Costa Rica for making Group e totally <laughs> chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> like they made it so that even if Spain beat Germany, Spain still wouldn't qualify and Germany still wouldn't be eliminated. So we yeah. have to give them kudos for that. Yeah. Here we have to Mikhail. Um <clears throat> for player, I'm gonna go with Antoine Griezmann. I just think what he gives France as yeah. a player that's just so good at roaming when they have possession of the ball. With, I mean, obviously, when you got Mbappe, it's just you always have to be worried about that. But, like, with France as well and how um, um, pragmatic uh, Didier Deschamps is, what he, what Griezmann gives you defensively in terms of his tackling ability and work defensively is just always impressive. And I think leading into the knockout stage is just something that's also going to be um, a big virtue to have for them. It's kind of unclear whether or not he'll go. Um, Deschamps will essentially play a three in midfield with like a Fofana and then move Griezmann out right or or not. But yeah. I mean, I, just what Griezmann gives France essentially as a player, you know, this what would a lot of people would seem to be like a luxury sort of like attacking midfielder forward player, but he's just so good energetically defensively. Is yeah definitely something I value a lot. Yeah, it's almost as if playing for a pragmatic coach at club level helps in, in his national team. Yeah, it also helps to play more than 60 minutes too, right? Yeah, <laughs> sure. sure. And, and team? 
And um, team this week was tough. Uh, got to be a team that got a result. Even though it was against Canada, I was extremely impressed with how good Croatia was. Um, obviously, we all look at the midfield as being extremely, you know, one of the very best ones out there with Brozovic, Kovacic, and uh, Modric. But what the forwards give in the, the final third of the opponent's box, their movement, their ability to kind of they do like delicate passes into the ball essentially to like whether it's the midfielders coming in the striker and then kind of crosses back into the box they're so so deadly of it so i guess looking into these um next few games for them in the knockout stages that's something i'm going to be very impressed with particularly because they'll be up against most likely uh or at least one of like a spain Germany or Japan or perhaps Costa Rica. It's a yeah. difficult, difficult um, round of 16 game if they get through. Yeah, it should be. And but let's not forget, like Croatia, they made it to the final four years ago. They mm-hmm. doing well in Nations League. They they qualified quite easily. So it's like they, they're they very were. Busy. However, they were not the greatest of sides um, in the Euro. Yes. But you know, for sure, what you're saying is definitely. Uh, <laughs> you know, clear they were finalists last year or last time around. Yeah. Just for myself, I'm going to stay in that group. I'm going to go for Morocco as the best performing team because I was really impressed with the game against Belgium. I'm a bit biased because, like, out of all the African teams, they're my favorite African team. So, and I would love for them to meet Spain in the last 16 if Spain finishes top. And for play, I'm going to stick with the African continent and go with Kudus and because of what he's done for Ghana, he's put Ghana in a very, very favorable position. Maybe they can advance 2010. We'll find out next week. Thanks, gentlemen, for coming on this uh, podcast, for joining me. But wait, there's, there's one more thing that I want to discuss that has nothing to do with the World Cup. Have you guys heard about what's going on at Juve? Uh, yeah, Agnelli has resigned. <laughs> That's crazy. It's so funny because every time there's a World Cup, Juventus finds a way to blow up during that. And that will be something that we'll keep an eye out for. The World Cup is the main discussion, but we'll keep an eye out for that. Do you have any comments, early comments before we close? Ricardo? Yeah, I just always thought that that Arthur Pjanic like, transfer was just unusual. <laughs> <laughs> Very unusual. I'm not saying that that's necessarily like, you know, the clear cut direct thing of what is problematic here, but they seem to have a lot of, I guess, what is it, like a pending legal and accounting matter. So, yeah. yeah it's just when Agnelli resigns, who's like pretty much owns your fences, it's, it means something must be brewing that we'll find out as the weeks unfold. It, it reminds me of Cal Chopoli in 2006, but. Hopefully, for their sake, it's not that bad. And I'm going to do the final close now, guys. Thank you for coming on. And um, we'll see you after Match Day 3. Thanks for having us. No problem. Thanks.